Welcome to our Patreon for People of the Free Gift. Here you will find courses related to all sorts of different subject matter related to the Bible as well as to life. If you happen to be watching this on YouTube, one of two things has happened. Either you've caught the first session in a course which will always be free, or periodically we release courses available for free on YouTube. But if you're interested, when you get to the end of this video, then just click on the, the card, the end screen, or the description down below and check out our Patreon. Welcome to session two of how to study your Bible process of observation. And that is basically asking, what does the text say? That is one of the most important things that it is the first step that you're going to want to take if you're going to accurately understand what you're reading in the Bible and be able to apply it in a way that it was intended. And by the way, we're going through K. Arthur's book, How to Study Your Bible, in this course. And so if you'd like to pick up a copy, there is a link uh, down in the description in chapter one. She details step one is beginning with prayer. And this is one of the reasons I really love this book is because it is identifying studying the Bible as a supernatural process because it is a supernatural book. So once you have begun in prayer asking for the Holy Spirit to help you understand the, the text and more importantly to help you see Jesus as you um, open up the text. Then we go on to step two, which is identify the context. And this is a very big step. Um, and it's not big in terms of it's complicated, but it's big in terms of how important it is. Because basically, uh, most of what we are doing when we are studying scripture is we are identifying the context and how this passage that we are reading um, fits into the overall context of scripture. Context literally means that which goes with the text. And in Bible study, context is the words, the phrases, and sentences surrounding a particular word, phrase, or sentence. And the context gives meaning to the particular word, phrase, or sentence, and helps you understand what the author is saying. And so basically put is words only have meaning in, in, in relation to the words that are around them. Words often have a wide range of meanings. And so to understand what meaning the word has in this particular instance has to do with how it is being used in context. And then those words are put into phrases, which are put into sentences, which are put into paragraphs, and those are put into books. And those books are within the New Testament. You, you see the wider and wider context that this applies to. So an example is, what does the word trunk mean? Well, depending on the context, you could be talking about the luggage compartment of a car, the flexible snout of an elephant, a large, rigid piece of luggage used for transporting clothing and personal items, the main stem of a tree, or shorts worn for swimming. And so the context really does determine a, a, large, a, a large amount of the meaning that you're, you're going to get out of the text. In an inductive study, context is determined or identified by carefully observing what is repeated in the text and seeing how it all relates. And that's what I was just said. How does this word fit into the sentence? How does this sentence fit into the paragraph? How does this paragraph fit into the whole of the book, etc.? And so step three, once you've gone over context, step three is observe the obvious. And this is something we don't really think about when we think about studying the Bible. We're usually concerned about the things we, we don't understand. So when you're observing the text, begin by looking for things that are obvious, things that are easy to see. And so this can be facts about people, places, and events, and these often capture our attention. Okay, and it's same with reading a book, watching a movie. And so uh, things that are repeated, these are often, we're going to talk about those as key words. If you see a word 
appear over and over and over again, and specifically by an author of scripture. And it happens to be a word even that other authors of scripture don't use very frequently. That's calling our attention. Hey, there's something important here. They're trying to communicate something very important. And this is a major theme. When you put together a puzzle, what do you do? Now, you know, I've had some friends who just go completely rogue and they just start trying to put anything and everything together. But if you're like me, then you look for the border pieces. Okay, those are, there's only four of them in any puzzle and they're easy to identify. Once you have that, then you look for anything with a straight edge, right? And so you start trying to put together the frame. And then once you have the frame, then you look for different color patterns, right? That are obviously going to go for if, with different parts of the puzzle and put those together. And then you put in the remaining pieces. And so we understand that process in other things, but it's just really about taking that and applying it to the Bible. Um, and so step four is deal with the text objectively. Okay. And this is sometimes hard because that what we mean by this is let the text speak for itself. And this is the, the fancy word for this is exegesis. Okay. And that is drawing, let drawing the meaning out of the text. The meaning is in the text. We are trying to get back to the author's original intended meaning and that the meaning does not change. Now this is contrary uh, to go on a little bit more advanced level than uh, something that's become very popular. And that is the idea that there is no meaning in a text until you as a reader assigns it to it. And this is not the approach that we are going to be taking. Um, there can be no meaning, no truth, no anything if you take that approach, and especially to Scripture. This is God's word. He had an intended meaning. He spoke through a human author. That human author had an intended meaning. And uh, he spoke to an original audience who heard something very particular. And that's what we're trying to get back to. Now, uh, the reason why this can be complicated is we can't help it. Like we come to anything and everything with a set of presuppositions, uh, an assumed worldview that, you know, this is the lens by which we interpret everything that we get into. And it's going to be very important if you are going to really understand the Bible and let the Bible speak for itself, then you're going to have to take off those, those glasses. The way that you come into the text, you tr try as much as you can to just be a blank slate and let the text speak for itself and just ask yourself, what does it say? And that is, that is really important. So our reason for being in the scripture can't only be subjective, which means to get something for ourselves. And Oftentimes, this is what's encouraged. You know, you sit around a Bible study table and the question is asked after you read a passage of scripture, well, what do you think that means, right? Or how, how do you think we should apply this to our life? And we want to jump straight into that, that, that step. And we need to be able to approach the text objectively, asking what does it say, go on that journey and that process, and then we will eventually get to the point of application. And so our primary objective must be to know truth and then adjust our beliefs and our lives accordingly. Uh, we are trying to get to know God better. We are trying to know what his will is for our life, what uh, his plan of salvation is. Okay, um, that's our objective. Truth and context never change. Okay, they're always going to be the same. And some of you are already asking, well, what does it mean when it says that the word is living and active? That means that God will and can and will speak through his word to you in, in, in different areas of your life, different times of your life, in different ways. But the meaning of the text, any given text, never changes. The way that it applies to your life at a given moment might change, okay? And so that is the distinction. The message of a book will always be the same. And only when you go through the steps of observation and interpretation will you know that you have applied the word correctly. And don't we all want that confidence that 
the way that we are living out our Christian life is the way that it was intended, the way that that passage of Scripture was intended to speak to our mind, our minds, our hearts, our lives, and change us. And all of the same, all at the same time that you study the Bible inductively, read it with a heart that wants to hear what God is saying to you. And that goes back to that first step of prayer, right? So step five is read with a purpose. And this goes to those classic uh, journalist questions, who, what, where, when, why, and how. Or we, as we call it in this study, the five W's and an H. Okay, so who? Who wrote this? Who said it? Who are the major characters? Who are the people mentioned? To whom is the author speaking? About whom is he speaking? What? What are the main events? What are the major ideas? What are the major teachings? What are these people like? What does he talk about the most? What is his purpose for saying that? When? When was it written? When did this event take place? When will it happen? When did he say it? When did he do it? Where? Where was this done? Where, where was this said? Where will it happen? Why? Why was there a need for this to be written? Why was this mentioned? Why was so much or so little space devoted to this particular event or teaching? Why was this reference mentioned? Why should they do such and such? How? How is it done? How did it happen? How is this truth illustrated? You see how this works? And as you get into this process, it will become more and more second nature. You will, as you read the text, you will start to say, oh, that's a who, that's a what, that's a when, that's a where. And you will begin to ask better questions and, and make better observations as well as you go into the text. And when you get really into this process, you will be doing these things automatically in this process, which might seem at, at first like it's maybe tedious. Um, why are we doing this? Why are we taking so much time? Why is this taking so much time? That you will start to see that you will all of a sudden there's going to be details that are jumping out that you have never seen before because you're not never taking the time, never slowing down enough to notice them. And the other reason is because you, what we're going to be doing, you're going to see as we get into this process, is we're going to be reading the passage and then over and over again, but looking at it through for specific things. What does this passage say about God? What does it say about us? What does it say about whatever key word that we've identified? And so we're going to find very different details and we're going to start to make lists of the things that we've learned about different topics in scripture or in the passage that we're reading. So when you rush into interpretation without laying the vital foundation of, of, of observation, your understanding becomes colored by your own presuppositions. What you think, what you feel, or what other people have said. And like I said, this is what often is encouraged around Bible study tables. And it's well-intentioned, well-meaning, but we all come to the, the, the table. This is the first time we're reading this passage and who knows how long, you know, we haven't looked at it this week. We haven't been asking all these questions. And even as after we read it, we're not even asking these questions, right? We go immediately into discussing the passage um, and mostly in reference to what does this have to do with us and what are we going to do with it? And so we, we are always skipping these steps and it, it is really crucial and it leads to a lot of misinterpretation of scripture. Uh, you don't have to find all five W's and an H in every passage because they might all might not all be there. And that's an important thing. Sometimes you might be going through, you know, okay, I found some who questions and I found some what questions, but I can't find any hows or I can't find any wheres or whens. And that's okay. Not every passage has all these. These are just the good questions that you want to ask to be thorough and to make sure you're not missing something. So we're going to now apply what we just learned in terms of the five W's and an H to perhaps the most well-known verse 
uh, in Scripture, and that is John 3.16. And so this is the ESV translation, and it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his, one, his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And so if you notice what we are learning in terms of context, this verse starts with the word for, and it starts in the middle of a quotation. And so immediately we should be asking, what is the for referring to? And uh, who is speaking? Who is speaking? And so in order to do that, we're immediately going to go backwards. And we're in the previous passage, uh, Jesus answered him, okay, uh, is how it starts out. And he, Jesus starts talking. And so this is a continuation of the quotation from Jesus. And so you may be asking still, who is he talking to? And the answer is Nicodemus. And so I don't have uh, the further, uh, you would still continue to go back in John chapter 3 and ask the question until you find the referent that it is speaking about uh, and Jesus is speaking to. And so the answer is Nicodemus. Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus. And so we're going to go back and read what he says before. Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? And again, you should be asking what things? And again, you would go back. He's talking about being born again, born of the Spirit. Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness... So must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So if you're reading this passage, you should be asking, when you get to that point, when, when did Moses lift up a serpent in the wilderness? And that would take you back to the Old Testament uh, book of Numbers, and you would find this, this um, referent point. Okay, so now we get a, a little bit of the previous conversation. And he says, for God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. You see, if you go back to the referent of Moses lifting up the serpent in the wilderness, what you find is that the Israelites were complaining once again. And so God sent a plague of serpents that started biting them. They started getting sick. They started dying. And so they called out to Moses, hey, God, Moses, go to God, pray for us. And God says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take a serpent, put it on a bronze pole and um, lift it up. And whoever looks at this just looks at it they will be healed they will be saved they will not perish so let's read what jesus said again for god so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life and so that gives meaning not just to what Jesus said, but it gives meaning to what happened with Moses, that that was prophetic, that had significance. You have a symbol of a serpent, which is a symbol of sin, right? Evil, and it's on a bronze pole, which bronze has to do with judgment, okay? Um, and this is what happens when you like take things, simple things like serpents or bronze types of metal, colors, numbers, and you track them down. This is the kind of stuff that you're going to discover as you study the Bible. You take it seriously. You just slow down and you start asking these questions. 
Okay, so that who, whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For, again, connecting point. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Now, as we went on, how many times did he say the word believe in this passage? And condemn, and saved, you know? Um, there are things that, words that you can already see as we go into this process that maybe you haven't thought about it this way, but this is how this works. So that is the observation process um, at the beginning of it. We're going to get more specific into it as we go on. But I would love to know your questions, your comments, the things that you agree with, disagree with, the things that are challenging. Um, maybe you start to apply this in, in your own scripture reading and it raises more um, issues, questions, concerns. I want to hear about all of those because I want this class over time to incorporate these things. And if once we get enough questions, um, you know, I will respond to every question that you guys ask. But once we get enough questions having to do with a particular class session, then we'll go ahead and make um, additional videos that are Q&A videos. Until next time, this is People of the Free Gift, and God bless.